All right, guys, welcome back to Unit 10, talking about aqueous solutions. And today, we're going to be learning about solubility. So again, the different sections are here. And today, we're going to be learning about what is solubility, double replacement reactions in aqueous solutions, reading table F from your reference table, and of course, doing some practice. Notice that there's reference table reading. Please make sure you have your reference table handy. All right, so let's start it off. So what is solubility? Solubility is a chemical property referring to the ability for a substance to be dissolved into another substance. So the solute being dissolved into the solvent. So miscible is what we would say if you have a homogeneous mixture of liquids. So if two things mix together, they are soluble or they're miscible. But if you are mixing two fluids together and they are insoluble, we call them miscible. So here are some examples of amiscable solutions. As we all see, these are lava lamps, and lava lamps are great examples of amiscable solutions. Also, anytime you're outside in a parking lot on a rainy day and you look down and you can see that rainbow, that rainbow effect is the amiscable solution between the polar water and nonpolar gasoline. In lab, we're going to be making some precipitates, so we're seeing a solid in a liquid that is amiscable or not mixed correctly. And we also have our favorite just the mixture of oil and water, showing again nonpolar and polar molecules. So dissolving ionic compounds into water, as we said in the last video, like dissolves like, but what happens is that water, because it is highly polar, will dissociate the ions or pull those ions apart. So NaCl, when you drop it into water, will actually create Na positive ions and Cl negative ions separately. Just notice very carefully that on the left, our sodium chloride is a solid representing a crystal, but the sodium ion on the right in pink is aqueous, meaning it's dissolved in water. Now remember in the past we talked about the entire crisscross method? This is the crisscross method, but the reverse of it. So let's try this problem. So what will MgCl2 solid when dissolved in water? What, what two ions are we gonna get? Well, we should get a magnesium and a chlorine. We should. But how many chlorines are we going to have, and how many magnesiums, and what charges do these guys have? Well, the charges we can find from the reference table if we forget, but magnesium has a positive 2 charge. There's only one of them, so we're only going to list one. Chlorine has a negative 1 charge, but it says Cl2, which means we have two of them that will dissociate. And don't forget, the total charge should be zero. So let's give this another chance. Now we're talking about silver nitrate. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion and it itself has its own unique charge. So if you take sodium nitrate and you dissolve it in water, you should get one sodium ion and one nitrate ion. All right, so let's try a really hard problem. Now we have aluminum dichromate. Now before any of you guys start freaking out, just remember, you have aluminum and you have a polyatomic ion dichromate. I know that aluminum has a positive 3 charge, so that's why there's 3 chromates. If there's 3 chromates, then I guess there's the 2 aluminums, that 2 comes from the charge of the chromate. So when you dissolve aluminum dichromate into water, you get 2 moles of aluminum ions and 3 moles of a dichromate ion. Remember all ionic compounds have 2 parts to them, one part positive, one part negative. You cannot have more than 2, so if you see more than 2 capital letters, there has to be a polyatomic ion, you have to check table E. In chemistry, many ionic mixtures are made under aqueous conditions because of their ability to ionize or to separate into you know, individual cations and anions. Because of it, it allows for double replacement to actually happen and we can predict those outcomes. So no matter what you put into a fluid, if it's ionic, it's gonna form those ions that we just saw in the previous examples. So using what we just learned, let's look at this double replacement reaction. So before you could predict, we have to dissociate those ions. That's the very first thing. That means we have to make them dissolved. So if you were to dissolve potassium iodide on the far left, you should get one K plus ion and one I minus ion. And if you were then to dissolve potassium nitrate, you should get one PD plus two ion in one NO3 with a negative one charge ion. 
And then when we double replace, the cations are going to switch places and the anions are going to have a new cation partner. So in case you forgot what a double replacement reaction is, it is a type of chemical reaction where two compounds react and the positive ions and the negative ions of the reactants switch places, forming two new compounds or products. So, taking what was just said, the metals are going to switch places. So we're noticing that the potassium ion is now binding up to the nitrate ion, and the lead ion is now binding up to the iodine ion. The only thing we have to make sure is that when we bind them up, their charges equal out. So you should get PBI2, or lead 2 iodine, and potassium nitrate. So let's try some of these. So pause the video and give this a shot. So if you were to take a silver nitrate and mix it with sodium chloride, the very first thing would happen is the dissolving process. You would get Ag and an NO3 ion. You would also get a sodium ion and a chlorine ion. The silver is going to bind up to the chloride, while the sodium is going to bind up to the nitrate, thus giving you the final AgCl and sodium nitrate. Does it matter if I wrote NaNO3 plus AgCl on my paper? Nope, because if you think about it, both of these species are existing in the same space and time, so it doesn't matter who you write down first. And they're both products. Yep. It's, as long as your products are correct, they can be in any order you want. So now let's try this problem. We have iron 2 chlorate, and it's being mixed with potassium hydroxide. So the first things we're noticing is that the iron is going to dissociate into an iron plus 2, and the chlorate is a negative 1 charge, while the potassium gives you a positive charge and the hydroxide gives you a negative 1 charge. Again, the metals are going to be swapping places, and you should notice that you're going to then produce a final compound of iron 2 hydroxide and a potassium chlorate. Again, it does not matter if you write them first or second, or in whatever order. As long as you get them correct, that is all what matters. So precipitates are a substance that is formed when you take two soluble solutions and when you mix them, you end up with something that is actually insoluble. All right, guys, so table F in your reference tables. Hopefully you guys have it out. We're going to be analyzing the solubility guidelines for aqueous solutions. So we notice on the left, we have ions that form soluble compounds. That's stuff that's going to dissolve in water. And on the right, we have ions that form insoluble compounds. So the insoluble compounds are going to be the ones that are precipitates. If we notice on the far left-hand side for the column that says ions that form soluble compounds, they will all dissolve in water, with the exception of anything over here. So for example, if you have a halide, all halides will dissolve in water unless you have it with silver, lead, or mercury. So lead to chloride is not soluble in water. On the right hand side, we're also noticing that this column, anything that contains those compounds, they do not dissolve in water, with the exception of these guys. So for example, if you have ammonium carbonate, the carbonate group is insoluble, but the exception is because of the ammonium, making it then a soluble compound. Also notice that the ones that are on the left, where there's ions that are soluble, group 1 and ammonium, which have no exceptions, are always the exceptions for the insoluble compounds, because again, they have no exceptions. Um, also, please remember that halides are group 17 elements, so anything in group 17 is considered a halide. They don't list all of them there, so just make sure that you understand that when you're reading those questions. Same idea with group 1, all group 1 elements, um, when they are in ionic form, will have zero exceptions. Okay, so we're going to try some out. Here are a list of different ionic compounds that we want to decide if they're going to be soluble or insoluble when dissolved in water. Before we pause and try them out on our own, I'd like you guys to understand that you really only need to figure out one of the two ions that make up the ionic compound if it is considered soluble or insoluble by looking at the column that says soluble compounds or insoluble compounds. Only look at the exceptions 
if you have an exception present in your compound. So pause and try them out. Hopefully you got these answers. If not, we'll go through them tomorrow in class. So here's another practice problem, but now we're going to be doing again a double replacement reaction and we are now identifying if our products are going to be solid and aqueous. Before I let you guys go, just remember, you are going to be dissolving these two different compounds and then swapping the metals and the nonmetals. So you're making brand new compounds. The difference is you now have to specify which one is a solid or an insoluble compound and which one is going to be soluble or our aqueous compound. That's where table F is going to come into handy. And remember, if it's already labeled as aqueous, like these two compounds are, you don't have to search for them. We already know that they're dissolved. Okay, so things you should have learned. Miscible versus immiscible. Dissolving ionic compounds. Double replacement reactions. Precipitates. Reading table F. All right, guys. Practice up. Rewatch this video if you need to. Definitely read some stuff out of the textbook. And have a great night.